what we're going to show here today is a lot of the serverless pieces. Uh, the way this session is set, set up is uh, we're going to spend the first half talking about a little bit more of the enterprise focus, going to bring up some customers, we're going to talk about the view of why they're into it, and then in the second half we're going to get pretty geeky, uh, have a lot of fun with uh, some demos. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, chances are I'm going to talk quickly at some times, but hopefully we'll stay up with it and have a lot of fun. So I think a place to start with this is what is serverless? Because what I realized with so often is this is a term that really just got coined four years ago. And if you ask 10 people, or in this case, 850 people, what serverless is, we're going to get at least 950 responses. So serverless, as we think about it, is really two different pieces that I want to draw your attention to. So one is the operational model. And what I mean by the operational model is, of course, no servers to manage. It does say serverless, after all. Uh, you know, fully managed security, pay for usage, right? A key piece. Do you pay just when you're using the product? But there's an equally important alternative view, too, which is the programming model, right? And this is, can it be a service-full architecture? Often, is it going to be event-driven? What's the developer experience like? Is it something that I have to spend a huge amount of time getting set up, or can I just use a single command? So when we say serverless, we mean both the operational model and the programming model. Now, Google actually has quite the portfolio of, of products in this. Uh, we call that the full stack serverless. You know, my goal and Google's goal is we want to enable your developer productivity. We want to make sure that you can focus on building just your own code. And to do that, we need to make sure that you have all of the components necessary. Now, uh, it's not a test. I'm not going to ask you what each of those little hexagons is. Uh, but the point is we have across, what is that, seven different areas, right? Data analytics, database storage, ML, compute, all of the pieces. Everything you need to build an end-to-end -end serverless story, right? And a lot of the pieces here have been built and developed for years. So you can have BigQuery for your analytics. You can have Firestore for your database. You can have App Engine and Cloud Functions on your compute. And you can use all of these seamlessly together to deliver the solution that you're trying to build. Now, I actually love to bring up a customer on stage here. So I would love it if uh, Laurent, if you would be so kind as to join us here. Laurent is uh, joining us here from Airbus. And uh, maybe you could start out, first off, thank you. Uh, maybe you could start out and tell us a little bit about what is uh, Airbus doing, just in general, in, in Optique and... Okay, all right. Thank, first of all, thanks for having me here uh, today in this impressive event. <laughs> so, yes, it's Airbus, so you all know Airbus, make it fly, so the aircraft, but I'm not working for the aircraft, I'm working for Airbus Defense and Space, which is doing um, um, geof geospatial information. So we have uh, satellites, they are flying over, taking pictures all along the day, everywhere in the world. And th those, those pictures are, we have to deliver to our customers. So we have developed our platform, which is called One Atlas, which is uh, sitting on the Google Cloud platform. So that's why I'm here uh, today with you. A and uh, the pl this platform is, is getting the image on board and di disseminating those images to our customer in a friendly way. I mean, as much as we, we can, but in real time. And, and also, when we have all of those images there, the, we, are, we are very happy to provide geospatial services to, to our customers so, so they, they can access to very high-end uh, services like uh, crops monitoring, deforestation, whatever you can imagine about uh, geospatial. So that, that's what with. we are doing. But I imagine it's, it's very small data you're dealing with, right? Five megs, that's it. Uh, no, no, that, that's not the story. Oh. It's, it's huge. So a satellite image, it, it, it's a big thing. So certainly we have a camera on board the satellites, but it, it's, each image is around uh, four gigabytes. And so at, at the end of the, the day, it's petas and petas of data that we have to serve each individual images real time to the customer. So it's, it's a kind of challenge. Yeah, and so you have this incredible end-to-end -end system. Tell us a little bit about where you're using serverless. OK, so maybe like uh, most of you, the, the, the heart of our system is Kubernetes. So we are using Kubernetes uh, engine. So it's taking care of uh, all of our algorithm, the remote sensing, photogrammetric algorithm, image processing. So they, 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 are, they are packed in containers, and they are powered by, by the Kubernetes cluster, which is uh, 
activating them at scale, so it can, it can be massive amount of processing. So that, that's, that's the main one uh, on the platform, but, and we have all the, the connected ones which are, which, are which are used, like the, the, um, the queuing messaging, like a PubSub, or, or we are also using a data store, so, so the database, so the, the images, as, as soon as an image is shown up in the database, uh, yeah, I've not said that, but the satellites are connected to the cloud, and each time it, they take a picture, it's automatically downloaded uh, on the, the object storage and automatically uh, available to the customers. So we, we have developed an algorithm, so AI-based, uh, which are uh, dockerized and, and running on the cluster, and, and they are scanning those images uh, all the time, and, and uh, the results are stored in data store. Great. And, and that's, that's very convenient for serving high-end information. And I think one of the most interesting things to me about uh, what Laurent and your team are doing is, uh, let's be clear, they're not using our compute serverless in production. So you use it in, in development phase, and you use a lot of the serverless pieces in production the rest of the full stack, but you finding you have security and, and regulatory concerns that you've had to meet without using uh, our compute products, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. We have, we have some classified images, so we have, uh, we have them in our own uh, data center on-premise. So on, on this data center, we are using Kubernetes too, but yep. it's not Kube Kubernetes engine. It's, we, we are powering it uh, ourselves, thanks, because it's, it's open source. That, that's, yep. that's the good thing. So we, when, when we move from the R&D environment, where it, it's very friendly to have a serverless uh, tool, see, it's really removing the burden of developing those functionalities, which are helpful, which are required, but which are not core to our business. What is core is uh, image processing, or, or all of that. So yes, it's, uh, in, a, in the development phase, we are very fast. Uh, we go very rapidly, thanks for serverless, and when it goes to operation, then we, we take a decision, do we use them or not use them, and how we deal with them. So uh, in our, in our on-premise, we don't use the uh, PubSub queuing messagery, but we, we have implemented uh, RabbitMQ. That, that's an right. example. That's awesome. So thanks so much for joining okay. us. I really appreciate you taking thanks the time Aaron. today. Bye. Thank you. Uh, I'm super appreciative that Laurent was able to join us, because I think one of the takeaways I'd like you to have is this isn't an all or nothing conversation. You know, don't get me wrong. If you want to do it all, I'm here for you. We'll make that happen. But if you're not, if you're saying, how do I get started? What you can realize is that there's incredible opportunities for your company today to follow in what Airbus is doing as well. Now, I want to talk about the compute part of serverless to, uh, uh, some more detail. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of this session talking about. And uh, one key takeaway if I could have you walk away from here, is that serverless is more than functions as a service. Functions as a service is critical. We're going to talk about it. But serverless is about, serverless compute is about so, so much more. So the first one we're going to talk about, though, is, of course, functions as a service. It's more, but here it is. So uh, you're probably already familiar with uh, Cloud Functions. But if you're not, Cloud Functions is a product that we GA'd uh, a year ago, nine months ago. Uh, and Cloud Functions provides you a very, very simple way of getting a small bit of code up and running in the cloud. It's frankly the easiest way you could take three lines of code, get it running, get a URL, and have it up. Uh, it auto-scales with usage very, very quickly. Actually, I'm curious. A show of hands, I can pretty much see in here. Uh, how many of you attended, session timing's funny, the 1 o'clock session run by Jason? Oh, great. So you missed uh, If you're interested in serverless, I'll say that uh, I'm not giving anything away. You can watch the recording of the demo. So in there, they, they took. Um, they took a workload, and, and we've, we've really been focusing on the last year and, and reliability and performance and real-world use cases. They did this incredible demo where uh, they went from nothing running, completely idle, no traffic, to uh, I think they did over 9,000 instances uh, running you know, in less than eight seconds. Uh, so there's a level of scalability here that's just not available anywhere else. It's uh, really Google Cloud only. Of course, it's... Um, uh, responding to events, and uh, you only pay for usage. Uh, so Cloud Functions, uh, one of the biggest use cases we see for it is as glue, right? So you can build a whole app. You absolutely can do that with a number of functions. But probably the number one thing we see people do is they're using the very rich event trigger system that we have built in in Google. 
and they're responding to an incredible set of things and building really interesting DevOps workflows and the meta management of their systems. And I actually want to, again, bring up another customer. So if you wouldn't mind, give us a quick hand for Lucas. Lucas from the Broad Institute is going to join us up on stage. Hey, Lucas. Thanks so much for having me. So Lucas, maybe we could just start out. I, I guarantee you no one knows what Broad is, so why don't you start out there? OK. Um, <clears throat> so the Broad Institute is a biomedical research center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We work on a number of different areas of science, things like cancer and psychiatric disease. Uh, but you may have heard of some of the work that we've done. We were heavily involved in the Human Genome Project, um, which I'm sure some of you are aware of. And also, there's a famous tool now out there called CRISPR, Cas9, which is used for editing genes. Um, so that's another one of the things that we're involved with. And so when you're not making the world a better place, you're actually using Google Cloud as well, right? Yeah, we're a big GCP customer. Um, <clears throat> we have a unique set up because we're funded by lots of different government grants. So the funding sources are numbered in the hundreds or thousands. Um, so for example, on GCP, we have like 300 different billing accounts. Um, and so at that level, we find that leveraging the cloud adds a lot of advantages for us. We can spend more time working on business value and less time working on infrastructure, which is why we're so excited about cloud functions. With the release of Cloud Functions, we took a lot of opportunities to try to figure out where could we use this technology in our environment. Um, there's a few different use cases. I think for us, we either have some situations where there's a new sort of greenfield service that we're building fresh, and it's a great opportunity to look at these new cloud services. And then there are also some legacy applications that we want to introduce some of the value from serverless to, for example, focusing on writing code and building business value and less on infrastructure. Um, so I'd like to show a couple of examples That'd of be great. Uh, functions that we've put together so far. So um, referring back to the billing, uh, we have, like I said, hundreds of billing accounts. Um, last year, Google released a feature for billing where you can receive notifications from your billing accounts via PubSub instead of via email. So I can uh, tell you that uh, a year ago, when we were receiving notifications from hundreds of billing accounts via email, it was very difficult to manage this influx. With the release of the PubSub notifications for billing, we were able to build an automated system to handle these notifications using Cloud Functions. So the diagram here shows that we have what amounts to hundreds of billing accounts feeding messages to PubSub at the rate of around 1,000 per hour. And um, then we have a cloud function that r runs each time one of those messages arrives, and it processes the message. Initially, all we were doing was feeding all these messages to a data store database and presenting them on a dashboard. Uh, so instead of having to look individually at 300 billing accounts to see how things were going, we could provide a single pane of glass for this. But now we've evolved quite a bit further, so we can um, set specific thresholds on different billing accounts. And when this cloud function runs, it checks the threshold that was met and the threshold that we've set. And depending on the situation, it'll kick off some other cloud functions. So here we have three examples. Uh, let's say that a budget hits a relatively low threshold that you want to know about, but you don't need automated action to take place. Well, we might send a, a message to you in Slack telling you about the situation. Um, sort of a bigger hammer that we have is uh, we will identify all of the running instances in the billing account and stop them. This is the, probably our biggest concern about spend is around running a large number of machines and forgetting to shut them down or something like that. And then the biggest hammer we have, uh, and this is generally from the pr perspective of when you have a grant that allows you to spend a certain amount of money, you need to stop generating spend when you hit that threshold. So uh, the big hammer is to just pull the billing account out from the projects and stop all You're services. Yeah. But this can be completely automated with cloud functions, which is great. Uh, and then we have one other example where we sort of have started to identify legacy applications, some big monoliths, and figure out where are the places where we can introduce serverless into these things. So what you see here is the first couple of steps of a very long workflow with dozens of steps that um, the on-prem version of this is basically implemented as a long bash script with a sequence of events. Um, so we like a lot of the cloud um, functions aspects here because each of these pieces can be like a separately deployed code base managed and, um, and tested on its own, and, and they're all independently scaling. Um, so what we have here is a situation where we can manually kick off this series of events by hitting a single cloud function with an HTTP call. Uh, and we send some credentials that are necessary 
to connect to Workday and pull down our daily feed of all the personnel information. Um, so the first function will pull down this data and store the raw data into a GCS bucket, which allows other applications that may need this data to read it downstream. Um, and then we have a second function that pulls in the data and does an ETL transform on it to prepare it for other systems that need it. And in, in this situation, we actually want to split off into a number of different new functions. So instead of um, writing a file and having another function which listens to that file, we have a bunch of functions that listen to pub subtopics. And so we publish into each of those topics, and it kicks off those functions, and the workflow continues. So these are just the first couple of steps of something massive that we're uh, piece by piece moving into cloud functions. These first steps are now completely serverless, and the rest is still running on-prem. But eventually, we'll get the rest of the pieces up there, and hopefully, it'll be fully serverless at some point. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking Thanks time. Thanks a lot. You know, one of the uh, funny things, you start looking at these diagrams, and they get more and more complicated. And I've certainly heard from customers the, the, um, the reaction is, oh, you're building a Rube Goldberg machine. This is going to be a disaster. But I've actually often seen the inverse, which is uh, because each piece is taking care of its own individual function, you start chaining them together, and you're depending on Google to worry about the chain and together worrying about us having the hard problems. And you actually find that you can build more reliable systems overall. The next product I want to talk about is App Engine. App Engine's kind of the OG serverless product, right? It's been around for over 10 years now. Uh, and this is, this is doing serverless before anyone had ever defined that term. No one knew what it meant. Uh, and it's going really strong. It's a fantastic product. If you're not familiar with App Engine, it's very similar to Cloud Functions, except instead of taking a single function, I'm going to let you in the secret. It's in the name. It takes an app. Uh, so it takes the full app, and you just push it up and deploy it, and away we go. So uh, you know, same kind of benefits, pay for usage, auto scaling, all of those. Uh, customers have really been finding they've been able to do some pretty amazing stuff with App Engine overall. Um, so App Engine and Cloud Functions make up what we call our compute platform today. And instead of breaking out feature by feature what each one we added, I wanted to give you a sense of the platform capabilities we've added, because I really think of this as a serverless compute platform. And so we're introducing today a, a huge number of new capabilities. This one, I, so like I said, I've been here two years. Uh, when I joined, uh, 30 days in when I joined, I had to do a customer advisory board meeting, sat down with a bunch of customers. And the number one request every one of them had at the time was, hey, how do I connect my app engine and my cloud functions into my VPN, into my VPC? How do I take advantage of all this great stuff? Took a little longer than I would have liked, but available today in beta, we now have VP serverless VPC access. This is a great feature. It lets you take advantage of, you know, you can reach all the way onto an on-prem database through your VPN. You could be taking advantage of Redis, uh, our hosted Redis, or SQL, all of the things that are in a VPC, a, a GKE cluster. You now have private connectivity to all of them. This unblocks an immense number of workloads. And we actually said, seen some customers so excited for this that uh, they've been using it since pr uh, in production since alpha. Um, uh, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about is scaling controls. So you know, as you're using more and more serverless, you start to hit these weird impedance mismatches. Serverless, right? You use App Engine, Cloud Functions. They'll scale until you, you, know, you can't possibly handle any more traffic, right? Billions of requests. It's not a problem. But that doesn't mean everything in your chain can handle the same level of traffic. So for example, if you have a SQL database backend, I love SQL, big, huge fan of it. You're not going to want to send 10,000 concurrent request connections. You're going to crash your database. So one of the things we've introduced is a max instance. This lets you now say, no, look, with my cloud function, I only want to have a maximum of 2, 20, 50, 100, whatever it is. It also lets you do a little bit of billing control if you're worried about making maybe some runaway traffic or, uh, happening. Uh, so this is also available in beta as of today. Uh, now there's a new, two new products that are available in GA. Uh, actually, I was looking through the, the Hacker News thread uh, about the announcement of some stuff, and, and people come and say, well, well, where's my cloud cron? How do I run cron in the cloud? I don't want to run a whole VM. We have an answer. It's called Cloud Scheduler. Cloud Scheduler is Cloud Cron. That's what it is. It's Cron in the cloud. It lets you run any task. It's in GA. And people are using this for a wide variety of things. You could be using it to you know, just trigger a function or an app. Some people are using it to, every hour, uh, turn off a VM or 
start a workflow or, you know, whatever. Anything you can imagine that you, uh, you might need. We have an incredible wide range of people using this across all of GCP. Uh, and we included an HTTP endpoint. And what that means is you don't just need to call a Google service. You can actually have it trigger any HTTP URL you want at any time you want. And so you can use this uh, on anywhere on the internet. Uh, and then this is, a, this is actually a product. We have an entire session, if you're interested, just on Cloud Tasks that's happening tomorrow. I'd encourage you to uh, attend. You can look it up. Uh, but Cloud Tasks is an incredible product of ours as well. This has been um, one of the most requested capabilities. So Cloud Tasks is a queue system. Right? And you often have the need where you're going to have some inbound set of work. You want to be able to rate limit or control, and then you're going to have some workers consuming it. Task Cloud Tasks is our product for that. It, too, is now GA as of today. Uh, it's been um, uh, based off of a service that was in App Engine. So it's uh, based on 10 years of hardened, hard earned uh, experience uh, and available to anyone who wants to use it today. Uh, Again, Vinod is giving a session on that one specifically. He goes into the depths of why you want queuing systems, how they work, what the benefits, and how this goes. Strongly encourage you to follow up on that one. So when you take uh, advantage of the products that we have, one of the great things about it is you're part of GCP. And this has been a core principle that I've been trying to make sure we take advantage of for, uh, since I've been at Google. So it's not when you deploy to us that you're using a different set of tooling. It's not when you're monitoring you're using a custom proprietary set. It's you're using the best of what GCP has to offer. When you deploy to Cloud Functions, although you don't see it, in the background, we are doing a Cloud build for you. Same thing that happens on App Engine. When you do a deploy, that's, you know, we're doing that. When you, um, when you then go to monitor, you're actually viewing everything in Stackdriver. And the benefit to you for this is it's super important in my opinion, and from what I've heard from customers, that as you grow and expand, right? maybe you're like, hey, I don't have 100% in Cloud Functions anymore. I want to start to use some other pieces. I need to pull in GKE, as Laurent was showing us. Then it's important that you're able to use the same tooling, and you don't just forget everything and start over from scratch. And so that's exactly what we've tried to build, right? Stack driver on the monitoring, Cloud build. And then I don't know if you saw the news about Cloud Code. This one, the little sequencing. We're going to talk a lot about it tomorrow afternoon in the keynote, but this is a new IDE plugin that it works with all of this as well. So this is all great. Um, and frankly, we could have stopped here. I would have happily taken my 50-minute session. I could have stretched all of this out, explained in more detail, gone through more use cases. But we're really, really fortunate here that uh, there's more. So. We've had a great adoption of these products. And consistently, the feedback that comes back is, this is great. I want to use more. I want to do something else. What, but uh, what about? What if? Uh. And so we've been listening to that a lot. Uh, and the first part of that is, of course, we need to give you better language support, right? You're limited if, if, you're, if, you're, you know, if, you're, a no, if you're a PHP 7 developer. If we don't support it. You can't do anything. So all these new runtimes are now available on top of App Engine and Cloud Functions. It's a little bit of a sparse matrix here. For example, Java 8 is in uh, alpha, not beta. But uh, for the mo and Ruby is in alpha only on App Engine. But uh, this is where you know, our goal is to have all runtimes available on all platforms, and we're quickly moving towards it. For those of you who've been with us on this journey for a while, it's noteworthy at how much faster we're iterating now. You may recall that about a year ago, we released open source to a project called GVisor. GVisor is under the hood the sandboxing environment that we use that enables uh, all of uh, App Engine Cloud Functions to, to work. And because of that, we've been able to use much more standard open source uh, software now. So we're really able to uh, remove all of the proprietary pieces that we used to have in the platform and give you the true idiomatic experience that you're used to, any library, any native module. And on top of that, it's also faster execution than you've seen. So if you're uh, using some of the older runtimes, you should check a look at these. So these are all available, Cloud Functions and App Engine. But that's not enough. Right? Because what if you have a language? What if you're, uh, I don't, anyone here a ballerina fan? That's actually a programming language. Alex is a ballerina fan. Uh, so ballerina is a really cool new programming language. Maybe you're into Elixir, Phoenix. Maybe, uh, maybe you're into Python 1.0. Uh, then, you know, what do you do? Or, or maybe you're sitting in a situation where you're like, yeah, but, you know, I'm in a company and we have a binary that we want to use, and, and it just doesn't work to, to have this source-based deploy. So we heard that pretty loud and clear. And what we realized is 
that today, we've made you have take a choice, right? On the one hand, you can choose velocity. You can say, this is great, I'm going to buy into serverless. Or on the other hand, I'm going to have the flexibility I want with containers. And we think it's time to remove that choice, that that's a silly thing to do, and we as Google can do a lot better for you. And so we're super excited today to introduce a new product. Cloud Run is the best way to get serverless agility for containerized applications. So what do those words actually mean? It's a good question. What we're going to do is we're going to spend the next 20 minutes actually showing you and giving you some demos. So now we're going to get into the more technical and geeky part of the presentation. Uh, and to do that, I'd love to invite up Donna. Donna, please come on up. Donna's a product manager on the team. And uh, she's gonna, we're going to be talking over some stuff. She's going to uh, give us a demo as well. While she's getting set up here, when you think about this container stuff, right, what we're trying to say is take a container, take almost any container. I'll, I'll give you the, what the almost means. But take almost any container and just deploy it. Right? When I say almost any, it needs to be stateless. Don't go writing to disk. Don't try and give me a database or an FTP server. And you need to listen to HTTP requests. And we're going to be able to take any binary, any language, any library, and run it. And we're going to give you an HTTPS URL with the SSL literally in just a few seconds. So the beautiful thing about this is it's not like what you might be used to. This isn't a situation where you're going to give us a container, and we're going to run it, and it's going to be running in the background, and we're going to charge you. No, no. Literally, it will only be charged for when you're getting a request. There's no background task that you need to keep for a web server. We're going to take care of everything here for you. It really lets you focus exclusively on writing your code, and it brings all those benefits I mo mentioned earlier about uh, scaling down to zero, scaling up, pay for usage, all that's there. But let's talk a little less and maybe give a demo. Does that sound good? All right. So I'm going to show you a simple web application that's currently running on Locker, Docker on my local machine. Because the idea here is you shouldn't have to use a specific framework or a specific programming model in order to be serverless. Uh, and the, what this web app does is it converts a Word document into a PDF. So let's just see how this works end to end, and then I'll show you the code. And then we'll deploy it to Cloud Run. So here, I'm going to choose a file. I have here a TPS report. Uh, I haven't been asked for one before, but if I ever am, I will have it ready in PDF form, all set. So let's take a look at the code. So here is my Docker file. It's really standard, really simple. I'm just going to pull down Python. I'm going to install my dependencies. Here, I'm using LibreOffice, which is actually a pretty old piece of software. Right. So like you just, like, let's just. Slow down for a sec. LibreOffice, aka OpenOffice, is a 16-year-old Java binary that we are shoving in and making serverless. That's pretty insane, right? We're installing fonts. Uh, and then we just install our dependencies. Here we're using Flask. So I didn't have to do anything special. I didn't have to say, oh, I'm going to use a particular framework or set up special routing rules. This is just the same way you'd expect to write your web application. So let's take a look at the code here. Uh, and you can see here, I'm just setting up routes, just as you would in Flask. And here, I'm just going to shell out to LibreOffice to do this. Now, uh, this TPS report, uh, I've seen Office Space. Uh, it was a really, really great documentary about how our industry works. And in Office Space, I learned that the most important part of the TPS report is the cover sheet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix this demo here, which all it does is convert to PDF. And let's add a cover sheet. So I just change this one line of code. Uh, and then I'm going to submit a build using Cloud Build, which is going to put this into container registry. And I just want you to note if before that command line goes off, right? So she just has standard Docker. There's nothing for Google specific. G Cloud submit, we're giving the container registry, and that's it. That's literally all you're doing. There's like this total standard way. This is how you'd build a container anywhere in the world. Uh, we just happen to be using the cloud to do it because we like the cloud. It's a good thing. So I already have this container built. It's actually a pretty big container because of uh, LibreOffice is a pretty big binary. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a cloud run service with an existing uh, binary that I already, container image I already created. So I just pick my container image. And I'd pick the region I'm going to use. Pay attention to this box here. I'm going to show you more about this later. Uh, and I'm going to open it up to the internet, because this is a web service. I want people to be able to generate PD P TPS reports. So now what's happening is it's creating a service. It's pulling that container image. 
it's routing traffic, it's setting up SSL, and it's done. That's it. Take a look right here. This is an HTTPS URL. I did not do any kind of custom config in order to get that working. If anyone has set up SSL before, you know what a pain it is. And that, you have to do it manually. That was deploying an almost gigabyte container, getting it running, doing a health check to make sure it worked. Sk everything you would have to do to do a deploy just happened in seven seconds or something. That's right. And you can see here it's running on Cloud Run. So let's see if it's working. Our TPS report now needs a cover sheet. And by the way, Oren is my manager. He has not asked me for a TPS report, but let me tell you, if you ever Today, need one, <laughs> I will give you one. All right, so let's upload this, and let's see our cover sheet. Here we go. It's her cat. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Uh, if we go back to the slides here. So, you know, it's great. We just showed you Cloud Run. You're like, this is incredible. I'm going to use it. But one of the things we hear from customers all the time is, yeah, but, but what if I want to run that somewhere else? Or what if I have a GKE cluster? What if I have an existing setup? And remember I said earlier, I don't want to force you to make silly decisions. I don't want you to have to say, oh, well, because I wanted X, I can't do Y. And so we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how can we give that experience, right? So what did Donna show you? She showed you two things. Remember when I talked about serverless? She showed you the operational model. There's nothing to set up. But she also showed you that program programming model, where as a developer, you literally just kind of click and deploy the container, and away you go. And we didn't show the, the CLI, but you could have, she could have done gcloud app deploy and done that there, too. And so one of the things we hear from customers all the time is, hey, that's great, but I'm already using Kubernetes. I'm already using, I already have a cluster. I'm just going to put that down. I already have a cluster. Uh, my ops team managed it. Maybe, as Laurent said, you know, we have regulatory concerns. We want to use Kubernetes on our side. And so we've been working on a project that you may have heard of. We introduced it nine months ago called Knative. And Knative enables us to have Cloud Run on GKE. So Cloud Run on GKE gives you the identical developer experience, but does it on your GKE cluster. Setting up Cloud Run on GKE literally takes three clicks. We're not going to show that part now, but it's literally just like three clicks in the UI. It's very, very simple. And then from that point on, you can use the exact same tools. So um, the point of this, right, is as a developer, you can have one experience. You can say, I'm going to learn the G Cloud command line. I'm going to learn the APIs that we use. I'm going to learn uh, how the UI works. And then know that you can take that workload that you've developed and move it on any Knative compliant uh, cluster. So, Again, I think show not tell, right? So Donna, how about we, uh, we go back and uh, show what you got? All right, so here we are, still in the Cloud Run UI. I'm going to create service again. I'm going to pick the exact same container image as before. I'm going to pick a slightly different service name here. Now take a look at the location. Instead of picking the Cloud Run region, I'm going to pick my existing Cloud Run on GKE cluster that's already in this project. And I want it set up so it's external because it's a web service. And that's it. So I don't know how many of you have deployed to Kubernetes before, but you know, applying the YAML can sometimes be a little tricky, and there's a lot of pieces that are involved, and uh, you know, managing all of that is hard. And uh, I can't even talk quick enough to have gotten through. Like that's how fast it happens. It's already right? done. So here we go. We have it all up and running. Let's just make sure the cover sheet is there. So, Don, I don't know if you know something else here. This is actually like this went by so fast. Did you see how quickly that loaded as well? So Donna, this, isn't the, this is running on a pretty different cluster too, right? That's right. It's running on a nine cluster machine on C Google Kubernetes Engine. And you get access to more machine sizes, more machine types, more RAM, more CPU. You have a ton of options available. Yeah, and so this is a great example of where you're making the choice. If you want that fully managed environment, you just want to be like, run the code. Great, we got that. But if like, I want to take advantage of TPUs, I want to take advantage of the incredible stuff Google's doing, I want to have a 64 core mega machine to, I don't know, Bitcoin mine, whatever, great, you, you can do that. And, and you can have the exact same developer experience, same CLI, the same UI. So I want to talk about what makes all this possible. So if you wouldn't, uh, actually before that, I want to talk, give you just a customer quote, if you wouldn't mind going back to the uh, slides. 
So um, this is a, a, a customer in Vio. So we've been in beta now for a few months with this product, and we've been, uh, I'm sorry, in alpha for a few months with this product. Uh, and you know, Cloud Run GKE enables all the financial benefits and simplicity without losing the flexibility of Kubernetes. This is, this is where it, it kind of hits for me. Now, I, by the way, in the room, I'm going to guess that half of you are sitting here saying, that's amazing. I can't wait to use it. And the other half in the room are saying, this is stupid. Why would you ever use it? And I want you to note that that's actually the whole point. I keep on talking to customers, and this happens time and time again, where I'll go and I'll talk to customers, I'll give them this pitch. And literally, they all say, I love your story. This is so good. But why are you even doing X, where X could be Cloud Run and GKE, or it could be Cloud Run. And they never seem to realize that the other side exists. And this is what we've seen, is that there are com every company is different. And it's really important that we're able to meet those companies where they are. Now, um, every company is different not only in the needs they have, but also maybe in where and how they're trying to run things. Right? And maybe they are super concerned about lock-in. Maybe they're super concerned about where can we do a different provider. Maybe they want to make sure that there's um, an insurance policy. Maybe they just say, I believe in open source and want to know that I understand what's going on behind the scenes. And so because of that, we introduced, like I said, eight, eight months ago, nine months ago, Knative. So what is Knative? Knative is an open source project that installs a CRD into Kubernetes. And that gives you workload portability. It gives you all of the primitives you need to build a serverless platform. In fact, it gives you what you just saw here. Knative is the reference implementation and API behind Cloud Run. It's exactly what we had. Uh, and we've been doing this with some incredible industry partners. Now, it just so happens, coincidentally, that I happen to have a PM from the Knative team up on here. So maybe you, you could tell us a little bit what happened in the last eight months. So I, what I like to say is we, it's eight months later, but we have about a whole year worth of updates. Uh, we just did the 0 0.5 release last week. Uh, the new things that are in there are in Knative eventing. There's a new model with broker and trigger. We have over 50 companies contributing. Uh, we have three times the working groups that we had when we started. We have this great collaboration with all of our partners and this great ecosystem. And my coworker told me that he saw two jobs on LinkedIn that asked for Knative expertise. So I think that's the sign that this project is really taking off. And it's, it's really remarkable. And like, by the way, we're on V0.5. These releases come out Every six weeks. Every six weeks. The, the velocity that's going on in the community is, is outstanding. And, and the partnerships we've seen here have really enabled some amazing stuff. In fact, if, you're gonna see, if, if you go to the keynote tomorrow, and you should go to the keynote, you're going to see a lot of the same demo we had. But you're going to have a little extra plus for some of the partner pieces that are going to be up uh, on stage after. Um, so Donna, thank you so much. I, I, oh, no. Oh, no. We have time. We're going to do. I forgot. Do you think we could do one more thing? We can do one more oh, thing. Oh, good. There's so, OK, I have, an admission, I have something to admit myself. I hate Docker. Uh, Docker files, they're, they're awful. Uh, if my background is a Rubyist. Uh, I don't ever want to have to see a Docker file if I could prefer not to. I think it's a, a great tool, but it's not what I idiomatically want to ever do. And so uh, it just so happens. Though the community has been doing incredible evolution. And so, Donna, I think you've got something really neat to show us, right? Yes. So this is just a standard Java Spring app. Nothing special about it, no Docker file, nothing. And I want to build this, and I want to run this in Cloud Run. So what I'm going to do is use CNCF build packs. And I'm just going to say pack build publish. Here I've put in a GCR container registry. I could put in any other one. And what's going to happen here is it's going to look at my code, figure out what language it is. You can see it figured out it was Java. Figures out what kind of build it should do, what the Java runtime should be, everything that I need to know, in, sorry, everything that I don't need to know in order to run my app, because it figured it all out for me. And then you get a standard container image at the end that you can just run on Cloud Run. And I want to clarify, we didn't build this. This, to me, is exactly why the partnership and ecosystem play is so important. This is built by Pivotal, built by Heroku. There were some engineers at Google, though not in our team, related. And because we picked the Docker image as our lingua franca, as the canonical way we work, it means that there's an entire ecosystem of tooling that you as the user and developer are now able to take advantage of. Donna, thanks so much for showing us and joining us on stage. And
that's, you know, a, a perfect segue into one more person I want to bring on stage, the last one. There's no more. So Eric, if you would be so kind, come on up. So Eric is CEO of a company called Stack Blitz, which we'll hear more about in a second. Eric, thank you for joining us. Hey. So, you know, I was talking about this ecosystem and the community play, right? And, and I think this is, to me, where it's all about. Uh, Stack Blitz is doing this incredible developer experience. You know, Eric, you want to just get into it and show us what you're doing? Yeah. Uh, you all want to see something pretty bonkers? Yeah? <laughs> uh, so in the next 30 seconds, we're going to go from idea to production in one click using just a web browser. I know it sounds crazy, but it's totally safe. You can try this at home. Uh, and it all, can we get the get demo onto the screen there? Perfect. Yes. All right, step one, open your favorite web browser, which is obviously Google Chrome. Go to uh, stackblitz.com, land on our home page, nice uh, Martian landscape. We click this Start a New App button. Let me just uh, give this thing a name, Demo App. And I can just choose a stack. We've got a couple of them here, a whole bunch of different languages and frameworks to choose from. Uh, I'm going to create one that Google made, one of the most popular frameworks in the world called Angular. And this, uh, this specifically with Universal ships with server-side rendering out of the box. I'm going to enable uh, Google Cloud Run for this. Choose my Google Cloud project. We'll go ahead and create a GitHub repo, too. Click Create App. And we have this SpaceX-like launch sequence happening for our app now. It's creating a GitHub repo simultaneously, doing a deploy to Cloud Run. You can see the GitHub repo just finished up. You can open that over here. See, it's been initialized. 16 seconds ago. Is that, is that new enough for us? Yeah. Uh, all right. Should, uh, should have liftoff in three, two, one. Boom. Oh, my God. Oh, I that was good that. timing. <laughs> is that not the coolest way to start an app like ever? Every, it's just like every single time. Um, so now our idea is now on production. I can open this up over on Cloud Run. You can see uh, we've got a hello world over here. You can see it's got server side rendering right there. It's pretty neat, right? And so uh, now we can actually clone this, pull it to our machine, install the dependencies. But I did say we were going to do all of this in a web browser. So I'm going to go ahead and just click this button here. We'll see what it does. And uh, well, it turns out we've actually got a whole environment in the browser powered by VS Code already spun up for you. It's gotten a head start. It's already set up and running. And I can go ahead and just uh, type in here. And it ships out of the box with hot reloading. So I can say, uh, hello, Google Cloud Next. Hit Save. Boom. So you update live over there, right? Uh, hit Command-P, just like in VS Code. <laughs> I, think, I think we have a, a Google Cloud logo in here. Go ahead and turn that on. Nice. Looks beautiful, right? Or what do you say? Should we put this back on prod? I think it's time to ship it. All right. So uh, I can go ahead and just click this uh, Google Cloud icon. Pulls up our VS Code extension. All I have to do is just hit this Deploy button. And uh, this box actually has your Google Cloud CLI installed, uh, ready to rock and roll. This is running the exact same build, step as, build steps as your local. It's doing a Google Cloud build, creating a, produ a production container image, uploading that to the container registry, and then pointing Cloud Run at that. And this is going to be live in just a couple of moments. But uh, while we're at it, why don't we go ahead and just commit our changes to GitHub, which also out of the box comes with your credentials. Don't have to set anything up. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, create a branch. We'll call this new feature. And I'll uh, stage these files and say I added the logo. Commit. We'll go ahead down here. By the way, in production, can I suggest you commit to Git before pushing to prod? <laughs> <laughs> I like living life on the edge. Um, all right, so go back over. And you can see, one click, boom, I can do a uh, pull request, just like on my local. You can see our changes. It's pretty neat. Uh, deployment's just about done. Because this is VS Code, it's got your type definitions. I can right click to uh, go to type definition, opens up our node modules and everything, and see what this thing does. And uh, our de deployment just finished. You can see down here in our terminal. And uh, instead of having to copy and paste that, we have this nice link right here. Opens it up. The cache should bust. Should bust. There we go. Boom. You can see our app is live again on Google Cloud. So that's StackBlitz. Uh, what you're seeing here is going into beta. And you can sign up on stackblitz.com. And thank you for having us. Awesome. Eric, thank you so much. So the ecosystem to me is really why I'm 
just so excited about delivering on this vision we've had for years. Uh, I think what StackBlitz is doing is really remarkable. I saw that demo and just like, yes, this is exactly the experience I want. Uh, but they're just one of a lot of partners we have. Uh, PureSec, GitLab, NodeSource, Serverless, uh, StackBlitz, uh, PureSec twice. Oh, you know, um, that's really amusing. Uh, that PureSec logo where it's monitoring should say um, Datadog. Yeah, that's really too bad. Datadog. Let's give a shout out to Datadog. Yay, Datadog! <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we have uh, great partnerships. I'm going to owe Datadog a beer after this. Uh, we have great partnerships with uh, a bunch of partners, with a bunch of these things. And this, this is really where we want to drive things, right? We want to drive it such that you can take all the advantages of serverless, the development experience, the operational experience, and you have all of the choice. You have the choice in the tooling, the choice in the partners, the choice in the deployment, the choice in the code. All of those choices you can make and get all the benefits that you want wherever it is. There's one other piece in all this to give you choice that I want to talk about, and this is Functions Framework. So the Functions Framework is this really interesting piece of open source code that we introduced this week. And what this lets you do is if you think about a function, right, func hello world, the gap between taking that and running that, there's actually a fair bit of stuff you need to do, right? You need to have a web server, you have to respond to the right thing, do the path routing, all this stuff. So the Functions Framework is our open source way of translating a function into something that can run. And so what you can do now with this is it's um, starting with node only, but you can do, what you can do is you can take your function and you can now take it from Cloud Functions and you can run it anywhere. You could run it on Cloud Run, you could run it wherever you want. Uh, and this is, again, very specifically designed for, hey, maybe you're having a Cloud Function. You're like, you know, the Cloud Function's working great, but I need this library, this FFmpeg flag, whatever. Great, put it onto Cloud Run. Maybe you're like, hey, you know what, Google, you've been great, but it's not what I want anymore. Great, take the Functions framework and move it off. This is exactly where we're trying to go, right? We want to give you all the choices. We believe that we're going to have the best product, and so we think you'll choose to use us. But it's going to be a choice you're going to make, and it's a choice hopefully you'll make and love. So overall, just as a recap as we come into the end here, I want you to be able to run anything. I want you to be able to run it anywhere, and I want you to be able to integrate anything. That's what we're working towards. This is a step one of a thousand steps we're going to take. It's a huge step, and it's one that our team's been working on for two years straight. And I can't tell you the excitement we have. Hundreds of people are all eagerly waiting for your tweets. Uh, they're obsessively watching social media to see how things go. Uh, I hope you love it. I hope you try it. Uh, I really encourage you to do so. So please, get started with Cloud Run. Learn about what we have end to end. And there's two other great sessions that are coming up that I'd encourage you to attend. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs>